Hey, this is Dark Matter Zine and I'm your host Nalini Haynes. Today I'm talking to Rowan Wilson. Rowan was born and raised in Launceston, Tasmania. He holds degrees and diplomas from the Universities of Tasmania, Southern Queensland and Melbourne. He worked in hospitality before moving to Japan in 2003, where he taught English for several years. For his master's thesis, Wilson focused on the conflicts between white settlers and Indigenous Australians in Tasmania. His debut novel, The Roving Party, won lots of awards. In 2014, his second novel, To Name Those Lost, won more awards. According to Wikipedia, Rowan still lives in Launceston, although it appears he works in Brisbane at the Queensland University of Technology. I guess it's not just Tasmania with the reputation for being behind the times, eh, Wikipedia? <laughs> Thanks, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Rowan. Hello, how are you doing? Good, thank you. How about you? Fantastic, thank you. Great to be here. Um, appreciate the, uh, the, the air time that you're giving me. Oh, you're welcome. So what's the commute like living in Launceston and working in Brisbane? Yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> Two hour flight every morning just to get to work. Yeah, no, I've been yeah. in Brisbane since about 2015. So been up here for five years now, four and a half years. Uh, came up to work at the Queensland University of Technology here and I love it. I love Brisbane. I love the university and I love I love teaching writing. It's, a, um, it's an endlessly fascinating and inspiring job. Uh, I feel very privileged to be able to steward my um, students through the early years of their career and, and help them to learn a little about this game that we call writing uh, and the publishing industry. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. And as a Hobartian, I'd like to offer you my congratulations for getting out of Launceston. <laughs> yes, I, I was fighting my entire life to try and get out of Launceston. It kept dragging me back. You know, I, I went to Japan for a few years and then got dragged back to Launceston. It, it has a very strong gravitational pull, doesn't it, Tasmania? We, we find ourselves dragged back there against our own yes. best interests. This, this is very true. Tasmania has a very strong gravitational pull and Launceston is kind of like the black hole. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> yeah, I have done my time in Hobart as well. I love Hobart. Uh, I, I love Tasmania, of course, and I've always written about it and I always will. Um, but it is good to get away from the island from time to time and live elsewhere. And I'll probably end up back there one day, but for the time being, I'm, I'm quite happy in Brisbane. Yeah, well, my partner and I are both... We both grew up in Tasmania and we'd both like to go back, but, you know, we need this thing called a job and an income. That's the problem. Yeah, mm. that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, we the economics just aren't great down there. It's very hard to survive. So, mm. yeah, that, that forces us all out at some point, doesn't it, sooner or later? Yes. Can you tell us about your latest novel, Daughter of Bad Times, that is partly set in Tasmania? Yes, it is. Uh, Daughter of Bad Times is about uh, a, a wealthy heiress named Rin Braden. She's the daughter of, of a, a CEO of a, of a giant correctional company um, who operate prisons and detention centres around the world. And she's fallen in love um, quite against her best interests with her housekeeper, uh, a guy named Yaman. And he, he's been the housekeeper on their little beach house, they have this beautiful little beach house in a, in a country called the Maldives, which is south of India in the Indian Ocean, on the equator, right on the equator. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of paradise, the Maldives. It's, if you want to picture it in your mind, picture kind of white beaches and neon blue ocean and, and coconut palms. And this is where the Bradens, uh, Rin and her mother, spend their holidays every year. Uh, and so during these summer sort of sessions they have there every year, Yaman and Rin secretly fall in love with each other and start this love affair. And uh, one thing leads to another and um, sea level rise occurs as it's been going on for part of climate change and, and the Maldives is destroyed. And Yaman ends up in one of uh, Rin's mother's facilities um, called Eagle Hawk Neck, which is in Tasmania. And he ends up as a refugee in this detention center. And, and when Rin finds out that he's there, she's determined to try and get him out at any cost to herself. Uh, and yeah, it, it goes from there. I don't want to spoil too much for everybody, but it, it, it things get bad for them, of course. You know, our lovers go through a lot. Um, but it's, it's supposed to be hopefully a book about uh, 
what's going on in the world at the moment. It's a very political book. It's a little bit angry, but it also hopefully it's a hopeful book as well. I like to think it, it offers a little bit of promise. I think having read the book, I think it is a warning like George Orwell. And to a point, it's, I think the hope is that if you heed the warning, we don't have to go down that path. Mm-hmm. However, <clears throat> you, um, you, as, as you've said, you, you set the novel at least partially in the Maldives and um, I believe the highest point of the Maldives is only two metres above sea level. Yes. So can you explain why you've, you've basically said that the Maldives is going to survive over 50 years. I mean, the current rate of uh, glacier collapse, ice melt, I don't believe they're going to survive that long. This could be 2024, not 2074. Mm. Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, I started researching this novel in around 2014, and at the time, the consensus was... uh, it depends, you know, the, the IPCC report had a range of values. And so they started conservatively, like if, if things go well and we were able to reduce emissions quickly, they thought maybe only 20 or 30 centimetres sea level rise by the end of the century. But if things were bad, worst case scenario, they thought around 85 centimetres by the end of the century. And this was in 2014. Um, so their worst case scenario in 2014 was 85 centimetres. That's now likely to be very conservative. I think it's much more likely to be over a metre by the end of the century, and it could even be more than that. Um, The the rate of change has picked up dramatically. Um, The feedback loops are kicking in. The IPCC have been warning us about this for a long time, but it seems as if they were too conservative. So I'm not sure where it will end up, but... um, I think I think I'm being reasonably conservative. In, I don't put a number on it in the book, but I, I'm thinking around a meter to a meter and a half by 2075. That's that's what my book is based on. So that that might be a little bit pessimistic, or it might be a little bit optimistic. I'm not sure yet. We'll have to wait and see. But at the at the time I was writing it, it felt perhaps at the worst end of things. So um, that's changing though. Unfortunately, scientists public statements tend to be deliberately conservative because they err on the side of caution. Kim Stanley Robinson was here in Australia in 2010. No, it was 2012. And he was saying that um, because he he confers with a lot of scientists to um, research his books and he was saying that privately the predictions were far more pessimistic and what was being said privately and what wasn't being actually acknowledged was actually far more dire than even yeah. the predictions that you're talking about now. That's right. That's right. And the, and the evidence is starting to support that now. Well, we've seen even just in the last couple of months, uh, a lot of evidence that shows that the permafrost in Siberia and around northern Russia is melting at a very fast rate, 70 years faster than they thought it was going to melt. So these things are really picking up. Um, and it's it's bad for countries like the Maldives. You know, these countries are existentially threatened. They, they won't survive that amount of sea level rise. And that's really got to scare us, you know, as a, as a, a group of people who are compassionate and who... <laughs> and who, who empathise with the people around the world, you know, that puts us in a tough position. We've got to act. We've got to do something. And my way of acting was, was writing the book and, and trying to get involved that way, I think. So does that explain your switch from historical fiction to future fiction? Because you, you've explored issues like racial tension before in your previous work, but, but this is a, a 180 degrees turn I think for your writing yeah it's a big change isn't it uh it's it's an interesting question though like it depends how you think about it I mean on the one hand when I started writing um 20 years ago I wrote science fiction and I I always imagined myself to be a sci-fi writer and I don't know why that is probably just because I grew up with Star Trek and Star Wars and that stuff and I and I've always (laughs) yeah well you know that there are the geeks of the world unite don't we so I've I always imagined that. And when I first started writing, um, I, I was always stuck with a science fiction kind of bent. Um, 
and it wasn't very good. I wasn't very good at it, and no one took it seriously. And it and it left me at a strange position. I had to make a choice. I had to decide if I was going to take writing seriously, or if I was just mucking around and playing with ideas that weren't very important. So I switched to historical fiction um, in order to kind of push myself to take writing seriously, and that that helped me to learn a lot about writing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the the two books I wrote, To Name Those Lost and The Roving Party, really taught me a lot about writing. And I felt like they were an apprenticeship. And once I'd done my apprenticeship, I felt like I was ready to take on something really difficult. So I started to think seriously about what I'd always loved and what I'd always wanted to do, which was write about the future. Um, But the, the thing is today, right now, when you look at the future, you have to look at climate change. There's no, there's no way around it. You can't imagine a future without a vastly changed environment. And that started, you know, that process of researching and thinking and looking really started to push me towards what was coming and, and what was happening. And I couldn't, I just could not look past what was going on with sea level rise. It really grabbed my attention. Um, I remember watching a, uh, like a, a publicity stunt, I guess you could call it, with, with the president of the Maldives. His name was Mohammed Nasheed in 2009. Uh, he held an underwater cabinet meeting with his cabinet and they put on scuba gear and they went down, they put tables underwater and they had pieces of paper and they were signing in these goggles and and masks and everything, signing um, declarations of um, different kinds of environmental action they were taking, trying to convince the world to take climate change seriously and to to consider the fate of the Maldives. And he said in an interview um, that I watched, uh, he said that, Somebody asked him, you know, what, what's going to happen to the Maldivian people if we don't if we don't agree on emissions cuts? And he said, well, we're going to die. Um, and he said that the Maldives is the canary in the coal mine. If the global community can't take our fate seriously, then what hope is there for the rest of the world? Mm. Um, and I came I came across this and I watched it and I thought he's right. Like he's absolutely right. Like if if we will sit around and let this country disappear, what else will we let disappear? You know. It, it, so his words kind of implicated me ethically. I felt like I'd been pulled into a conversation. So that was the kind of starting point for me, and I went from there. And we can be very focused on the immediate. So, you know, Australian news is focused on Australia. What people don't realise is that two-metre sea level rise will drown the Maldives. But we will also lose a significant proportion of our infrastructure. Adelaide is, the the bulk of Adelaide is not two metres above sea level. Look at Melbourne. I'm not sure how far above sea level the Hobart Hospital is, but it's not that far. Not very (laughs) far. (laughs) And it goes on. We we will lose, you know, just two metres and we will lose a significant proportion. It will cost Australia billions of dollars. Mm. Look at mm. the floods in Brisbane. That's right. Yeah, well, a lot of Brisbane is not much more than about a metre above sea level as well. Mm. Yeah, that's right. There, there are whole portions, um, that, and there are entire cities in Australia that are less than two metres above sea level, but there are whole proportions of our capital cities, of course, that would be affected by this. And Yeah, it's quite dramatic. But, um, you know, as a white Australian, the safe thing to do, the smart thing to do, would probably have just been to write about that. You know, a future where uh, Melbourne has lost a lot of its waterfront area. You know, I could have written about that, but it didn't feel as if the threat to Australia was on the same level as the threat to the Maldives. It felt it felt like I was being a little dishonest somehow if I'd have written about Australia um, when, in fact, the real threat, the most immediate threat is to these other cultures and other places. And I think that's one of the things that climate change is doing to us. It's forcing us to think globally, you know, and about time too. It's about time. But climate change really forces you to look outside your own backyard and consider how these things affect other people. And I know that my experience was very much like that. It it forced me to... um, Think much bigger than than just Brisbane or even just Queensland or Australia. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the genesis of the novel, really, for me, I think. Once I knew it was the Maldives that I wanted to write about, I then had to figure out all of the different connections and how all the different pieces fit together. Mm. Yes, because the bulk of the novel isn't actually set in the Maldives. A lot of the novel is set in Tasmania. And I love the connection between our current 
refugee camps on Manus and Nauru, US prisons where people are used as slave labour. And it's all situated on Eagle Hawk Neck, right smack next to Port Arthur. So how did you get to that place? Uh, well, Port Arthur was kind of a starting point for me. Um, I guess that's part of being a historical writer as well. Like you look at, you tend to look at that trajectory. You, you tend to, when you, when you sit down and do research for historical fiction, um, you're constantly in this process of thinking, um, you know, haven't we changed? H haven't we come so far? Look, look how things are different now. Um, <laughs> that, that trajectory is always immediately apparent to you. And, and even though when you're actually writing the fiction, you're trying to convince people that um, it's happening in that time and of that time. So you want people to think um, it's totally natural that when you want to light a fire, of course you pull out like a, a, a striker and a flint and, and, you, and you spark a fire into a campfire. Of course that's how you light a fire. We don't have lighters or matches. You know, those things, are they don't, they're not around yet. <laughs> so it's, you're, you're, trying to, you're playing this game with your readers, um, even though you're comparing when you look back and you're looking at that trajectory, you're trying to convince them that no, this is actually taking place in the past. So that process of looking backwards and forwards always to me felt like um, something that I wanted to include into the novel. And so Port mm. Arthur was my way of including that trajectory and, and tying this book to my other two books and tying it to Australian history and tying it to Tasmanian history and talking about who we were and where we come from and where we were going. So I think there's a very clear very, very clear and strong connection between Port Arthur and Manus Island or Port Arthur and Villawood Detention Centre. These facilities operate under very similar principles um, and even more so in the US where you would be forced to work or, or in a, pri a private prison in Australia where you would be forced to work as well. So those mm -hmm. facilities exist in Australia and, um, you know, not much has changed in a lot of ways. I didn't realise we had private prisons in Australia yet. I thought that was... Yes, we certainly do. Around 18% of prisoners in Australia um, are housed in private prisons and they're forced to work at many of them as well. Yeah, against their will. Indeed. That happens in Australia today. Yeah. Wow. Not for our refugees. Not for our refugees yet. In America, if you're in immigration detention, you would also be forced to work. That doesn't happen here in Australia yet, but it can't be far away. And I saw on Twitter just... Today, yesterday, the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre is talking about how a lot of the government has just removed um, subsistence payments for refugees who are living in the community. Mm. So we're getting one step closer. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes, cruelty is um, Liberal Party policy, really. So you know, that's, that's the world we live in. You said it, I don't even need to get on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're currently working on a sister novel or a marriage partner, I, I forget quite how you put it, for Daughter of Bad Times, and yet right. you've said it's a comedy. Can you tell yeah. us more? How does one partner being comedic and the other being deadly serious work as a pair? <laughs> Uh, they're, they're an interesting couple, these two books, a little like my first two books. They're, they're not quite, um, they're not quite a traditional sequel and prequel, I guess. They're, they have a relationship, they share characters, they share themes, but they don't quite connect. Similarly with these two books, they share themes and they share characters, but they don't quite connect in, in the way that we imagine books to connect otherwise. So, um... In, in Daughter of Bad Times, uh, Rin Braden um, finds her adopted mother. She, she tracks her down in Japan and, and speaks to her. And her mother in Japan shows her some photos. And one of the photos she shows her is, is of her grandmother, Lulu. Um, and she explains to Rin that Lulu was half Australian. Her father was Australian. And that makes you one-eighth Australian. Um, uh, that moment, I put that moment in the book very deliberately so that I could write the book I'm writing now, which is about Lulu Sakurai, which is Rin's grandmother. So this book is about Lulu Sakurai. She's a young woman. Uh, she's half Japanese, half Australian. She returns to Australia to find her father. She hasn't seen him for 10 years, and she shows up on his doorstep kind of out of the blue. Um, her father is 
overjoyed to see her. He hasn't seen her for so long and he's desperately missed her. And he's been living a very kind of lonely, miserable life um, as an academic in Brisbane, a little like me, <laughs> except, except I'm not lonely or miserable because I'm married. <laughs> whereas, whereas he was not, not that kind to his wife and they, and they divorced uh, early on. So it, there, there are some autobiographical details in here. Um, but then uh, the interesting part of the story starts to take place when they bond, they, they start to bond together and, and learn about each other by playing a video game together. Um, so Lulu is um, a kind of a big shot inside this video game that she plays. She's very good at it. And she convinces her father to play with her. And he's so impressed by her kind of skills in the video game and her ability that he, that he starts to get drawn into the game as well. And they learn about each other and they, they kind of um, help each other solve their life problems through this video game. So it is a comedy, um, but it's, it's also about sort of similar things to what Daughter of Bad Times is about, you know, um, capitalism and how it forces us apart and and how we're left miserable by the current you know economic world that we live in um yeah, those, those themes occur again sounds potent this this video game is it actually a real like a game that exists or is this a game that you've made up it's a game that i made up based on bits and pieces i've taken from from real video games yeah it, it's a combination of about three or four different games it doesn't exist yet, and the technology probably isn't quite ready for a game like this one. It's a, it's a virtual reality game. Um, it's open world, um, and it has elements of um, multi, massively multiplayer games like World of Warcraft or um, Rust or Eve, those kinds of games. So, um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to write. It's very, very difficult, very difficult to write about virtual spaces in fiction. William Gibson made it look easy when, when he did it in Neuromancer and, and all of his books. Um, but it, it's been an extremely difficult challenge to overcome. But I think I'm starting to crack it. I'm starting to figure out how to make that world um, as fascinating as our own world, I think. Yeah. Well, I'm intrigued and I want the game. <laughs> so do I. Yes, it's it's my dream to have a game like this. Well, um, one day it'll happen. Yeah, it's going to happen. We we might need to wait a few more years for the technology to catch up. But uh, a, a game where we can put on a headset, you know, and, and go in and just become another person. Uh, yeah, that's that's the dream, isn't it? To have to have that dual life, that mm. double life. Yeah. Yes, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but apparently World of Warcraft has developed is developing something in. It might be in beta or something. Um, I'm not quite sure of the stage, but you're supposed to be able to get on your computer, you know, get into the game, and it links with um, like walking on a treadmill, things like that. So you can oh, actually. Right. And to me, I mean, that is fantastic. I mean, what a bet what better way to actually, you know, combine exercise with playing a game. I, I yeah. love the concept. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, we've got a VR set here in my house and uh, it, it really is physically quite draining. You know, you're moving around, you're, you know, jumping and crouching and moving your head. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a workout. It's a workout. But mm. in a good way, though, I think, yeah, it's, it's deeply, deeply enjoyable to be in those worlds. You, you really do um, lose a sense of... Uh, yourself or, or a sense of the outside world you're, you're fully absorbed in that world it becomes it becomes the world which is a, a really really deeply fascinating thing to me and speaking of the world you're off to london next week are you planning to say goodbye to the motherland before it sinks under the weight of brexit <laughs> yeah hopefully there's still something there when i get there and it's not all just a smoldering ruin but <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, it's my first time in the UK, so I'm really looking forward to that. I'm going over to a creative writing conference over there and um, talking about my book a little and presenting some of my research. So it's going to be a great time. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, I'm really desperate to get some of that old-fashioned English food. I want to try some fish and chips while I'm over there and, uh, you know, pie and mash and <laughs> those kinds of things. So, yeah, maybe an English breakfast somewhere. Yeah. Well, uh, I have to say that all sounds much better than a pie floater. A pie floater, yeah. <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I am partial to apply floaters sometimes. I, I really do enjoy them from time to time. So you have <laughs> been in to, to, you, you have been to Adelaide and tried their delicacy. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. When I was in Adelaide, yes, yes. No, no question. Yeah, it was top of my list. <laughs> I lived in Adelaide for eight years and I've never tried a fly floater. Oh, <laughs> so really? What... Next time you're there. <laughs> so what were, you, what were you saying about Hobart? Did you ever try a, a curried scallop pie while you were in Hobart? Oh, yeah. I lived in Hobart for most of my life, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is well, it, is a, it a Hobart our... thing? Oh, it's a Tasmanian thing, absolutely, yeah. Very, very oh. Tasmanian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that explains why they're never anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you'll only find them in Tasmania. They're very rare outside of that. I think the scallops are probably too expensive everywhere else in Australia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess I guess there are some things, some benefits of living in Tasmania. I remember there was a time where I could not eat crayfish because I'd had so much of it. It was like, no more. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I remember those times as well. My father was a cray fisherman. Yeah, <laughs> I used to eat so much of it. It was just an everyday food. We would have it every day. Yeah. Mm. Delicious, but you get tired of it. Yeah, yeah. And everybody else is going, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, during my research for the roving party, uh, I came across an account of some um, some convicts who were living on the on the East Coast. It must have been around Bishnol 20, somewhere around there. And their master had been feeding them crayfish every day, crayfish and abalone every day for like a period of months because it was cheap and easy to catch. You know, you could just you could just throw a pot in the water and catch as many as you like. Hardly and they believable. were complaining. Yeah, they were complaining because they were sick of eating crayfish and, and they wanted they wanted salt salt beef and, and mutton and those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, it was very funny. But the irony was, was quite hilarious to me. Tasmanian problems. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My final question to you, drum roll please. Who would win in a fight, Superman or Thor, and why? Oh, that's a tough question. Wow, Superman or Thor? Hmm. I don't know. I would probably lean towards Thor. Um... But then, can he fly in space? Because Superman can absolutely fly in space, can't well, he? I'm Thor not can. sure if Thor, Thor can. Yeah, he, he goes on that bridge, doesn't he? That rainbow mm. bridge. Yes. Yeah. But he survived in Infinity War, didn't he? He was in space and he survived mm. and got picked up. Okay, well, that's a tough one. I don't know. I, I would perhaps lean towards Superman in that case then. Maybe, maybe Supes would get him. I'm not sure, but... You might you might need to ask somebody a little bit better versed in in Marvel and DC lore than I am. Um, oh, look, it doesn't have to make sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not much about Marvel and DC makes sense, does it? <laughs> no, especially not a Marvel versus DC conflict. Mm, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. I, I I really loved Superman versus Batman. I know most people didn't love that movie, but I loved it. I thought it was terrific, and I loved the fact that Batman actually won too. <laughs> I thought that was great. Uh, that was one for the little guys, I thought. <laughs> I confess I haven't watched it, but watching Wonder Woman, and even though the Justice League wasn't as good as Wonder Woman, that and Wonder Woman's role in the Justice League has now got me interested in watching more DC. And DC's TV series. I mean, what's not to love? Yeah, that's right. No, I, I agree. I love Wonder Woman, and I thought Justice League was pretty good too. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've always loved all of those kinds of movies. I grew up with them, and you know, I remember the the Batman from about 1987 or 1988 with um, uh, Jack Nicholson as the Joker. You know, that movie absolutely blew my mind. It was it was just the greatest thing you could ever imagine as a as a, as a young kid in, in the 80s. Um, yeah, that that was one of the things that really got me interested in writing and interested in making characters, I think, that movie. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Do you have any other... I know I said I, it was my final question, but do you have any other specific um, influences or stories, mm. authors that, that have influenced you? 
Yeah, a lot. Um, for this book in particular, um, there are a, f- a couple of books that really helped me to shape it. I think one of them was a book called Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. And for your listeners who are, are unfamiliar with Sarah Waters, she's a, a British author. Um, she writes what she calls um, lesbo historical romps. Um, her characters are always queer um, and they're usually young women um, and they they inhabit a kind of marginal space in, in Victorian or early 20th century London life. And so Fingersmith is about these two young women. Um, one of them is very rich and one of them is very poor and they fall in love. Um, but they're involved in this heist as well. They're involved in a, a scam to steal money off this rich woman. Um, and there are all these double crosses going on and it's it, the plotting is extremely intricate. You know, there are two or three plot twists in this novel that absolutely blow your mind. You know, they're some of the greatest plot twists I've ever read in fiction. You, don't, you simply don't see them coming at all. They're completely blindside you. And they make perfect sense. Um, and yeah, it's just an extraordinary book. I highly recommend it to anyone out there who's listening. So that was one big influence on me. And I think the other one, um, the other big one was a book called Zone of Interest by Martin Amos. Uh, it came out a few years ago. It's about um, the death camp Auschwitz um, in World War II. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little grim, but not as grim as some of the books I've read about Auschwitz. It's also a little bit satirical. It's poking a lot of fun at the Nazis um, uh, and, and really kind of doing some damage to them with satire and irony and making them look completely, at the same time as they're murderously dangerous, also making them look kind of completely uh, incapable of achieving any kind of thing that they want to achieve. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting book. And that's also, it has a romance at the centre. This um, a Nazi officer falls in love with the wife of his superior uh, and they try to um, survive the war, I guess. They just want to survive. They just want to get through without being killed mostly. Um, yeah, very, very interesting book. It's also quite funny, um, but very, very dark as well. Well, I'm... I'm don't know whether to be pleased or cross that you've just added two books to my reading pile. <laughs> but they You'll sound, love them both, I promise you, yeah. They sound absolutely amazing. Well, thank you very much for talking to Dark Matter today and have a fantastic trip to London. Yes, thanks, Millie. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. <laughs>